Back in 2019, I was asked to be the subject of an Earth Month photo shoot for Oprah Magazine in a neighborhood called Serenby, just 25 minutes outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Serenby, however, wasn't just any town. And in fact, just three decades before, it was simply a lovely farm that had been bought on a whim by Steve and Marie Nigren, who had lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and run a successful restaurant business. I'll let Steve share his story of how he brought a town together, turned his farm into a now 1,100-person community, and helped annex a new city known as Chattahoochee Hills, which encompasses around 40,000 acres. Through Steve's tireless work and vision and the development of sophisticated zoning and transferable development rights, the new city agreed to permanently protect 70% of the city's land as forest and farm, and then consolidate development on the other 30% in a variety of hamlet, village, and towns throughout. Serenby has undoubtedly become a model for a different kind of development, with community and conservation at its core. Well, last time I was here it was 2019. Wow. Shooting for Oprah magazine. It was cold. <laughs> That's all I remember. Oh, it was cold. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was freezing. That was that was pre-pandemic when when I was here. Actually, not much before. But tell us what Serenby is, because I had never heard of it, and then it, I was flabbergasted when I was here. I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. <laughs> I mean, the short story of what Serenby is, it's a reaction to urban sprawl. Uh, Which you see a lot of, actually, when you're coming from the airport here. Couldn't well, believe it. Well, it depends on how you come. Mm. Because we, we've saved uh, a huge area. But chances are you came 85 and Tommy Lee Cook, which is a, a poster. And, and it's true across America. What you're, the farm, where, where we are now, uh, we bought as a whim in 91 when our children were small. We were living in the city. We had what we thought was the perfect life, big house with all the, all the trappings. Uh, and it was just a, a, a weekend drive to show the kids farm animals. Uh, and the, the farm was for sale. And uh, we just bought it without any thought other than, well, it's close to Atlanta, it's a good investment. It'll be fun to bring the kids out a couple Saturdays a month. And uh, we could rent the old house out, the historic 1905 house. And there was this little shack that my wife fixed in case we ever wanted to spend the night. And to our surprise, it's where the family wanted to come every weekend. I mean, we had all the trappings in the city, the pool, the big yard, everything. They wanted to come out here where we had nothing other than a connection to nature. And doing that every weekend for three years was a value shift. I think people can better understand it after the pandemic, how people reevaluated their lives. That's what happened to us uh, on a three-year drip on weekend visits. Um, and so I had an opportunity to sell my hospitality company. We sold the big house. And in 1994, we moved out here and started restoring the old historic farmhouse as our personal residence. So it, didn't it took a few years, basically, and you were like, this is, this is where it's at. And I, if I remember correctly, you weren't planning, really. When you came here, you, you, were you weren't really planning on buying the farm. And then you saw it. Number one, we weren't planning to buy it. And it was just that emotional decision. I say many times, you know, we, we've forgotten how to follow our heart. Yeah and we rationalize too much about yeah. life. And so, no, had no intention to buy the farm, uh, had no intention to sell my company and retreat from the city. Uh, and then, six years later, uh, the threat of urban sprawl. So after six years of this great lifestyle out here, uh, one morning, my daughter and I were jogging along uh, the path that was the edge of our property. At that point, it was 300 acres. We'd put the old farm back together. And as we came up over the hill, the bulldozer was bulldozing the forest next to us. Mm. And I ran out and I stopped him and I said, what are you doing? And he said, we've just been hired to clear the trees. I guess they're putting houses here. That's what always happens. And with panic, I ran back to call the retired doctor who owned it, couldn't get a hold of him. 
and in the next few weeks, as I called other folks to see if they knew what was going on, I had 600 additional acres under contract in that effort to save our own backyard. Mm. And the retired doctor returned from Europe and I found out he had sold it to someone down the road to put in a pasture airstrip for a small plane. Oh, wow. So the immediate threat was over, but it was my wake up call. Yeah. And that was the beginning of what we know, now know as Serenbita community. And the, the trees are beautiful here. I mean, it was one of those things that when you walk here, they're just like so tall and so straight and so wooded. I, I could imagine the horror that you probably felt when you're saying, oh, my goodness, are you, those are going to be bulldozed over and turned into a parking lot and a development property. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you see where that happens uh, across. You know, I, I'm uh, a generational uh, uh, family out of uh, Boulder County, Colorado. And so all the fields where I grew up are now subdivisions of Boulder and, and Denver. In uh, north part of Atlanta, Roswell, I opened a, uh, my third restaurant there in 95 and I had to drive through four miles of country to get there. And now you can't tell where you leave Atlanta or drive into this area. So yeah. once it starts, it happens very fast. Yeah, I mean, but you know, if I, if I recall some of your initial stories is that, um, you know, you had your family here but then friends started to come over and they wouldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that was the beginning of uh, Saren be the bed and breakfast. Okay. Because um, when uh, we came out, we fixed the shack mm -hmm. that, that's there. And then uh, friends would come out for dinner, wine, and they didn't want to drive back to the city. So this is the 1930s uh, barn. Uh, and so we fixed it one room at a time. And by the time we moved out here, it was a three bedroom, four bath guest house. And then suddenly friends realized we had all these, you know, places. And uh, an artist down in New York called one July and she said, the, the garbage strike is just getting to me. I can't take it. Can I come and spend a couple of weeks in, in the loft up there and I'll paint your farm animals. I've been wanting to do that. And I said, sure, come on. Four months later, she was still there. Uh, my, <laughs> Got a my, lot of farm animals to paint. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, she ended up, we have beautiful portraits of our daughters that she did. I mean, it, it was wonderful. She was running out of uh, things to paint. <laughs> That's right. And so that was the beginning of a bed and breakfast because a yeah. friend said, just post rates and everyone will know they're, they better leave at the end of their two weeks or whatever you invited them for. And so I said, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. And uh, we, we did that. And, then the Atlanta Journal-Constitution did a story. We found the Nigrans, because we had literally retreated. Uh, they're running a bed and breakfast outside. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fun, a weekend kind of yeah. thing. But, yeah. yeah, but it, it seemed like it happened organically, because you, you, know, you preserved a lot of this area for, I guess, you know, conservation or for nature. And, and this area is really integrated in nature. But Serenby now is neighborhoods. It's like, it's a larger community. So you didn't go away off into the woods and say, okay, well, this is, this is my uh, plot of earth and you can't have any. You actually decided to build neighborhoods. Well, it, that's an evolution because first was, it was a resignation that, that there were things that we weren't happy about, about politics, about the way development was happening, but what could one person do? And so it was a resignation. I can worry about my own family, and so we're gonna retreat from the city and come out here and find our own little paradise, which we did right on the you know edge of Atlanta. Atlanta's just up the road, you know, for foreign films, ethnic food, sports, medical, anything was right there. So uh, we were very lucky to, to have found this. Uh, and then uh, when it was threatened, the, f the first thing was to, yeah, buy more land, you know, expand my fence. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I realized that wasn't practical, uh, we thought about creating a model. And uh, we turned to Ray Anderson, who you know, Carpet. founded Interface yeah. Carpet and was the first U.S. industrialist mm -hmm. to put his company on a carbon neutral footprint. Mm -hmm. And he had been a friend for years. And so I said, Ray, help me figure out how we're going to do this. And so Ray uh, talked to the Rocky Mountain Institute, and Ray and the Rocky Mountain Institute brought 23 thought leaders here in September of 2000. And that was the beginning of, think, of thinking about how we could address some of these issues. But at the, at the close of that two-day session, I said, Ray, I'm more depressed, <laughs> you know, 
These issues are big and all over, but there's no one applying it mm -hmm. to community style. You know, how are we gonna show how to change it? And so Ray in his way would sent me to see the Rainies outside Chicago and here and there. And finally said, well, if nobody's doing it, why not you? Mm. And so somehow in that period of time, he pushed me through that threshold of passion to where I stopped analyzing whether it was wise or what we should do and realized we had to do this because it wasn't that complicated. It was like we developed 100 years ago, but we stepped so far away from it. Steve realized he would never be able to save all the beautiful land around him from thoughtless development and began a multi-year process of figuring out that perhaps one can save and cherish a place through responsible community development, which centers around well-being. So that was in 2020. And then when did you really get, well, probably not shoveled to ground, but maybe architectural layouts? Like, how did that all transpire? Well, that was 2020, but then... Uh, I realized that great models actually destroyed the area around them. And so we spent the next two years bringing 500 landowners together to create a common vision. Now, these were your typical uh, pro-development, you know, uh, looking to develop the land because of the economic value of it, and others didn't want this land touched. Uh, I think, you know, the inherited landowners uh, uh, we're totally divided. Half said, bring on the bulldozers. That's payday we've been waiting for. Right. And the other half, don't touch us. I want my grandchildren to see these trees and yeah. these fields. And that is, uh, I just have to interject, that is so common because we, uh, I mean, I know you have some connections to the Finger Lakes as well. A lot of your kids have gone in and around Cornell and <laughs> married people from Ithaca. And all, all my son-in-laws are from I know, it's so crazy. <laughs> it's so bizarre. <laughs> um, and, and your daughter's a hotelie from, right. yeah, from Cornell. Uh, so it, it's kind of an interesting thing up there. There's, um, you know, land conservation, land trusts, and we saw some really beautiful land, but they're like, nope, you can't touch it, you know, or, or you can't, <clears throat> you can't like build anything more than a shed on that. And it's a, it's a hard push pull, you know, there's like, where, where's the middle ground? Because can't people live on land while still conserving it and appreciating it and living with nature in a certain kind of way. And, and Serenby's kind of doing that, and you know, it's doing that. <laughs> well, we looked at the very issues. I, I mean, our first reaction was to buy land. And then when we, wa we realized we wanted more, we went to all the conservation groups. And so the, what you're talking about is many times where land is put in conservation. That's mm -hmm. been what we've done in the United States. And they were all busy putting their money in front of the bulldozers where the threat was already there, yeah. and the threat had not arrived here yet. With the threat of rampant development nipping at the heels of their farm, Steve and his wife Marie decided to take matters into their own hands and engage landowners, policymakers, and leading thinkers to come together over many years to rethink community development on a scale that surpasses any that I have seen before. Through perseverance and a strong commitment to vision, Steve and his family set out to do what seemed impossible. Though he was laughed out of meetings with investors and got intense pushback initially from an array of naysayers, the Nigrans forged on. And pretty soon, their farm became the heart of a much larger community. Five neighborhoods designed on the model of English villages are situated on 30% of the land, so that 70% of the land remains green space. And soon, a coalition of 40,000 connected acres owned by surrounding landowners became the city of Chattahoochee Hills. During the years of retirement, we took the kids to England a, a lot. We had a, a dear friend who lived in this little town uh, uh, southwest of London called Selborne, and realized that there's a different pattern here because after World War II, they couldn't afford the urban sprawl. And so they put good land laws in. And so you see a lot of people living in little hamlets, villages, and towns, but it still feels country. And so we saw that as our model. Um, and Rocky Mountain Institute helped us find Phil Tabb, who did his uh, doctorate on the English village system. And he was uh, uh, head of architecture at Texas A&M. So we brought Phil in, who had never professionally planned 
uh, communities. <laughs> he was purely an academic. Yeah, he was theor theoretically writing about it, right? That, that's right. <laughs> but, 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 but his mind was clear. Yeah. You know, generally find that anyone who is a professional in whatever field, they are so conditioned on the rules and regulations and what should happen. Preconceived notions. That many times they can't really think out of the box right. in, in, in what's happening. So th this was a whole freedom of thought. Um, and so we spent two years bringing the landowners together. And with the large uh, developers, the people that were going to develop their land, uh, luckily the uh, uh, Urban Land Institute had just done a study on why we had so many golf courses in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and bankers loved the value that developers were getting for the lots facing golf courses, so they would fund generally a development that included a golf course. But the Urban Land Institute studies show that 92% of the people who own those expensive lots played golf twice or less a year. <laughs> Meaning they were buying it for the green space, the green space they weren't yeah. buying it to be on a golf course. Right. And so to the large landowners, I said, what if we could get you the higher values without the expense of installing or maintaining a golf course? So. They that made logical sense. Yeah, and you, it's it's important because you were basically speaking their language. You had to speak the language of many different types of people: That's the conservationist, right. the developer. So the large, would, it, it was economic value. They didn't necessarily want to develop, but that traditionally we say that is the highest and best use. Mm. But and so then the people that didn't want touched, I went to them and said, "What what if we could approach saving 40, 50 percent of this land?" would you support development in the area? And uh, of course, at best, they could save 10%. But, you know, there just isn't money to do it in the various mm -hmm. conservations you look. Uh, and so that's how we started serious conversations without everybody fighting. And, and you know, we had some of those early meetings where everyone, ah, you know, uh, and we brought them together. And so we were able to find something where each group got more of what they expected because our land plan will save 70% of the land for agricultural use. No place like that in the United States. And we'll put 20% more housing on the 30% we're disturbing. The Metro Atlanta has done per square mile in the last uh, three decades, and that's true of most uh, urban areas in their sprawl method. Mm. So everyone is getting more of what they were concerned about, and it's a win-win. And so by the time we took it to our local county commission to pass this regulation, we had 80% of the landowners paying dues into the organization to promote this. The 20% that didn't support us also never opposed us. They just stayed home. Right. Well, I think that's important. Like the, you know, one of the things that I think that we often <coughs> overlook is that you have this preconceived notion and then you go and do it and then you ask for forgiveness or ask for permission later, but you were really engaging the stakeholders along the way in dialogue, which is like incredibly important in order to be able to push out like this newer concept out to folks in order to get the buy-in. That's right. And, and we didn't come in and say, this is what we should do. What are we all worried about? How do we want to take control of our own destiny? Because that was me. I wasn't intent on developing this. I was intent on finding a solution to save the majority of the land. Mm. And that's when I discovered the only way we were going to do that is to develop part of it and to come up with a, a system that tied development to trigger preservation. Mm. I mean, that's what should happen. Yeah. And you look at what it costs some areas to preserve, uh, any area that's come close to uh, preserving uh, this much land, it's millions and millions of dollars through conservation, and that just wasn't available here. Right. If you look at Lexington, Kentucky, or Napa, you, you know, you, you'll see some of that. That kind of money wasn't here for this. So let's uh, step back and understand. I'm always fascinated about how things are actually structured. You, you went out, you got the land, but then you, you have started to develop neighborhoods here. And I'd love to understand, like, what is considered communal land? What's considered, I don't know, conservation land? What's considered, uh, you know, is the, is the house owned by a person? Take me through that structure a little bit and like whether there's an HOA or anything along those lines. So we also have an audience right here. 
They're very, they're uh, very interested. The, the chickens. Uh -huh. they, want well, to they love it. There's all these visitors, and they think we might have something in our pockets for them. You know, <laughs> a little bit of grain. <laughs> that they, Either uh, that, or they'll eat our pockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, goats they, just they, eat they about anything. Out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, continue. Sorry. But um, so number one, we, we we brought zoning regulation in that required this trigger. So we have what we call a hamlet. Hmm. And you have, it's, it's 250 acres is your minimum. Now, several landowners can come together. You know, it doesn't have to be one landowner, but it has to be one master plan. We're 70% of the land saved for agricultural use. Is and, this, and is that how a hamlet is defined? And that's, an, that's a hamlet. Okay. And then what, we look at one unit to an acre. So that means you can put 250 housing units on the 30% you're disturbing. Hmm. And you can use up to 20% of your land for commercial. We have what you call a village, and in a village, you do not have to do, you only have to do about 10% internal preservation of your 1,000 acres. But for every acre you develop over one, you have to uh, save uh, the equal amounts of acres outside the village. Hmm. So if you were taking it up to 36, which is the limit on an average, you have to save 35 acres for every acre you develop to that degree. And so this allows smaller landowners to participate in the economic development by selling their development rights. I see. Now, out west, this is easy because people have been used to severing their mineral rights and their water rights. Mm -hmm. But in the south, you either own the land or you didn't. This yeah. was quite a trick to understand. Yeah. And so in 2003, we passed the uh, Transfer Development Act for Georgia. I think it was the first in the southeast. Uh, Boulder County, uh, uh, Colorado, and Maryland County, uh, ha uh, Virginia had these, and so we brought them in to counsel uh, our state leaders, and the University of Georgia modeled that legislation for us that we passed, and our Association of County Commissioners for the state uh, carried that for us. So w we really, it was a lot of stakeholders that we brought together to make all this happen. And over what time period? Because sometimes that just takes a, a well, quite a while. It was, it was uh, two years to bring the community together and we passed the zoning regulation in, in 02, the transfer development in 03. We broke ground on Serenby in 04 as an example to show this had happened. And we had so inspired this uh, people in this 40,000 acres that we then petitioned the state to become our own city. And so in 2007, we were established as the city of Chat Hills. Mm, wow. Uh, so that was taking charge of your own destiny. Yeah. And, and so this allows a, a, any landowners to participate. You either come together to have a, a hamlet size, uh, or you can sell your development rights. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So then you you started. Uh, I guess they're called neighborhood. Are they neighborhoods? We they we call at, at Serenby, uh, yeah. We have Hamlet zoning, and then we're creating uh, neighborhoods within that zoning. Okay. And so it's clusters of housing and retail and and, and mixed use commercial uh, in these clusters. And then how many uh, neighborhoods within those? Yeah. So at Serenby, yeah. uh we uh, on, on our master plan now are five. Okay. And we realized that uh, as, as once I realized we were going to be a developer, you start looking at what are the things that make great places. Um, and of course, England is our example of density and preservation. So there was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. And then you look at other things. So generally, great places through the centuries have had an art patron or the church. Art is a vital part of the community. And we stepped away from that uh, in, in, in many ways in America, funding it or even understanding it. And so um, the, the first community, the focus was on art. So in Selborne, you'll see places for art galleries, art studios, uh, the streetlights commissioned by an artist. That was the beginning of, uh, of that, whether it's the trash cans, the benches. But to make it possible, uh, we created a transfer fee for every house sold now or resold. Uh, and now we are uh, contributing over a million dollars to the Institute to, to bring art and environmental programming to the community. So th this way art, artists can be artists and not have to worry about raising the money to stay alive right. in the next few years. So basically as, as soon as a house gets sold, a percentage goes to the art fund, which is probably a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit. Yeah. that's right, with a separate board. Right, so it's a separate board. And that uh, fund is funded at closing. Oh, okay, I see. So then, and then that goes to 
commissioning artists, like maybe putting them up here? Like it, It's our art farm where we have visiting artists. Mm -hmm. It's to bring in uh, really incredible art. Mm -hmm. uh, for and, and this is open to anyone. People drive in from Atlanta and all over that we're bringing this quality art. Right. Uh, and then do you uh, pursue the artists or do artists apply? How does that actually work? Uh, it, it, it's all those things. Okay. It, it, you know, it, yeah. it, it, uh, a variety of things. But we have all this rich, rich uh, uh, art program from all the various disciplines is happening here 52 weeks a year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, you see it when you walk through, you'll see art that's like integrated within the landscape, whether it's sculptural or, you know, I mean, the landscape itself is a piece of art. <laughs> you have right. to, you know. Well, well, you hit a key, key point because we understand that beauty is an important part of how we live and how we think about places. Mm -hmm. And we've forgotten about details on architecture, uh, where a view shed is, how, how a street turns, what you see when you turn that. And so we have really focused on all those details here. Uh, and that's, surprisingly, that's unique. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you go to beautiful places uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, Dan Butner, who did uh, the Blue Zone book, and I said, Dan, I think you forgot one important point. And he said, what's that? And I said, beauty. I said, every place you, you cite is beautiful, but <laughs> you didn't really you list didn't that. explicitly say it. That's yeah. right. And, and, and I think that's one of the things we forget is mm -hmm. that we, uh, for a healthy attitude, which now we know results into, you know, basic health, you had to feel good about what you're seeing and how you feel about your surroundings. Yeah, I think the complication with it is that, you know, a lot of times somebody says, oh, that's so beautiful, but we don't know how to express it beyond that. It's like the taste of an apple. You're like, ooh, that's, that's uh, crunchy, but you're like, but that's not, a ta that's not the taste, you know? It's a sour that leaves maybe a little, <laughs> little bit of oak at the end of it, or, you know? You know and, and sometimes people cannot express why this is beautiful That's like right. what and, and well and you'll see at Serenby one one of the things is is our relationship to nature rather than imposing our plans on nature we really work with nature so m minimal grading uh leaving old trees where we can really working around it we'll change a building plan uh we'll move a road to save a great tree mm. and because it adds to the beauty of how we feel about where we live. So right. that, that's a huge difference. Right. Well, it also gives a sense of place. And I think one of the things that maybe we didn't explicitly say, but you actually did um, touch upon it, where you could drive from Atlanta to Colorado and it feels the same, you know, and, and there's a sense of place here. I mean, the fact that you have big, beautiful trees, that you have this nature scape, this um, soft rolling land, you know, the, the water, the way that the animals integrate in it, the, the wildlife, the bird song, the bug song, when you like wake up in the morning, that gives you a sense of place. It's not cookie cutter at the end of the day. And in addition to that, it's places for people to gather and hospitality. Mm. This is why the Blue Eyed Daisy, we, we opened it in the middle of the woods <laughs> By the time the fourth resident had occupied, we didn't count rooftops and wait until we thought that there was enough people here. Because you have to have those places where people can commune and, right. and, and come together in a, in a very natural way. Yeah, I mean, it feels to a certain extent like religious. You know what I mean? It feels like you're getting baptized as you walk through the <laughs> landscape in a certain kind of way. You know, it's, well, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's a religious experience. It feels, it feels like that. It, well, it, it, it's, it's touching into the spirituality of the earth and the atmosphere, and we, for, we forget that, that, that we're, we're in this incredible uh, place. Mm. And we've had a tendency for the last several decades to not honor that and, in fact, to destroy it. When we look at how we chemicalize our front yards because we're trying to make it artificially green, um, the, the noise of air compressors, uh, you know, that's why we do geothermal here because we want to hear the birds and the kids laughing mm -hmm. rather than this buzz to run all of the things that we think are essential to our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying it's a sacrifice, there are just other ways to do this and we're not looking at that. Going back to the neighborhood, um, and I, again I'm trying to go back to three or four years ago when I was here and I was chatting with you, one of the other things that if somebody were to like actually rent their house out or, or leave or if it was their, you know, summer house or anything like that. 
Serenby has an opportunity then is set up to be able to rent that house out for the people. That's correct. Is that, is that That's correct? correct. Yeah, we, we, we try to, um, we try to be low on rules only that make sense. And if we can all maintain a common respect for one another, we don't have to have as many rules. Yeah. And so that is a big piece about neighborhood. You, one thing people notice is everyone waves at one another. Well, don't you do that with people you know? Yeah. And so as the community's grown, that has stayed in. And uh, of course, people talk about moving here and they're here for a couple months and they know more people in their neighborhood than they do from where they left and had lived 30 years mm. because th we're physically set up mm -hmm. uh, to be a pedestrian. So you walk to get your mail, you walk to the restaurants, you walk to the shops, mm -hmm. you bump into your neighbors. And there, it's just a complete different atmosphere. Uh, but everything you see at Serenby is not very different than how communities existed 100 years ago, mm -hmm. except we have high-speed fiber. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but from the front porches to people walking on the streets, from knowing your farmer, knowing your neighbors, <laughs> There's nothing different, really. And also talk about, we're walking through the animal farm right now. We have one of your, your uh, resident donkeys that are here. But talk about the farm itself, because it's, it's kind of like a farm for everybody, and, but it's central to Serenby. It's not like everybody has to have their own farm, like this is the farm for everyone. That's right. Well, so two things when you t speak about the farm. Yeah. One is we're now uh, in the grounds of the inn. Which, which is a historic farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and while we don't uh, grow crops here anymore, uh, we, we do have the animal village and uh, so people can kind of see. Uh, <laughs> kind of feel like he needs a little rub on the head, right? Th this started with uh, all the uh, pets that we, uh, when we moved here, you know, we started <laughs> Uh, assembling farm animals, so this has all emerged from when this was our private home. And, oh, wow. And uh, the, the, the kids, you know, at, at first I thought we were going to grow our own protein, but then yeah. the kids started naming everyone, and so that didn't work out very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late, too late for that when you start naming them. <laughs> but then our second community is focused around the farm, and so when you see Grange, uh, that's where we have a 20-acre uh, farm uh, that is uh, operated as an organic farm, uh, and we put the farm right next to the houses, or we planned that all together. That was just a raw forest when we started, uh, which seemed logical. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the way I grew up. You, you had the farm, it's right there. But there's been an attitude that farms are smelly and no one would want to live next to them, so mm -hmm. you don't see that. Well, industrial farming can be right. both noisy and smelly, uh, but organic farms aren't. Um, and so uh, that was logical. And when a New York Times reporter came to do a story on us, she tagged it an agrihood, and that's kind of stuck as a trend. So that, <laughs> that's a good one. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, but now, in, and the agriculture piece isn't just in the fenced farm. Uh, at every crosswalk, there's blueberry bushes. All the common area over there is edible. Yeah. Uh, so that's... Uh, so it's good. So people can actually walk into the landscape, pick berries, and have that experience that we may have all had when we were kids. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And kids understand the seasonality of foods. Yeah. What do you want to say? Oh, didn't get his daily pets today, did he? Oh, we'll take as many as you can give. <laughs> <laughs> they're... they're um, Muscular animals. Oh yes. They really feel the... Well, when you think about a mule, I mean, they'll they can pull and carry yeah, and pull carry. Yeah. Some people ride them. They're, they're workhorses. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was suffice. He said that was a good that was a good pet. Okay, so and then in the towns, I mean, you have you said twenty percent within the within the neighborhoods have uh, commercial spaces. So what are some of those? commercial spaces that you have? And I notice you have also a farmer's market and things. Well, we, th this is one area that has not developed as fast. Uh, so for instance, on our master plan, we have built or are building uh, about 30% of our planned housing that you'll see either occupied or a structure started. Okay. We have only completed 8% of our commercial mixed use. So it's very minimal. We have led, uh, you know, in, in, in Selborne, the first one you'll see the blue-eyed daisy, 
and then uh, the 9110 building where the Hill Restaurant is and we have a collection of offices and shops there. Uh, then down in uh, Grange, you have uh, the general store, the bookstore, uh, some retail spaces. And then our school now is occupying three spaces that, that uh, the school has grown, so they've kind of... Oh, wait, I, don't, I didn't know you had a school. Oh, we have a school. We're building okay. a whole campus. You'll have to go down and see the whole it, campus. Is it like a K through 12, or <clears throat> what kind of school is it? It is uh, 12 weeks through high school. Okay. Uh, and it's Acton Academy. And, uh, yeah, we're get, getting good noise. <laughs> <laughs> we're worried that we're leaving. Yeah. Um, He's sad. But Active Academy, this started as a uh, parents coming together and uh, a Montessori-based, mm -hmm. and now has grown. Uh, during pandemic, people just came in. So we have about 220 kids enrolled. We're building a campus for uh, 400. Uh, if you go down, you, <laughs> you'll see uh, they're right now installing uh, Tesla solar shingles, mm -hmm. uh, the first installed uh, on any commercial building in the mm -hmm. world. Wow. And so all the kids will be able, on their computers or in monitors in the room, see how much energy their building is generating and how much it's using. Mm. Uh, so kids growing up here uh, are learning about where their food's growing, how buildings performing, yeah. how we can actually live in relationship with the earth without uh, consuming more than uh, we're giving. Yeah, and I would imagine this is like a, a real idyllic place for, for children to grow up because to have that neighborhood feel and to be able to walk around freely and everything, that's something that's becoming less and less like within America. It's amazing how many people comment on our free range kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, if you're familiar with Richard Liu's work, Last yeah. Child in the Woods. Yeah. But it's, it's essential. It's actually part of the child's brain development mm. to, to have this freedom in nature to make decisions. And we just stepped so far away from it. Yeah. And now we're working on free range elders. Uh, and I think the pandemic has shown how uh, uh, unkind many of our facilities have been uh, for the elder generation. Yeah, especially, and then also just to be able to keep active, That's right. you know, throughout, you know, your eight, eight your, throughout your ages. Yes. You know, and then you might still want to be able to garden or have a little flower bed or whatever, but that might look a little different than when you were 20s and in your 20s and your 30s. Totally. I mean, we have preconceived ideas of what age restricts yeah. and uh, we, we we set it up in the way we build places for people to age yeah you had you have five neighborhoods that were kind of staked out Are, and they're all in different stages of development or that, that's right so okay. in Selborne which is the focus the commercial area has a focus on art uh, we have built basically all the houses but the commercial center has not yet developed other than a few buildings. But uh, this fall, we plan to break ground on a 110 room hotel and a 45,000 square foot office building focused on environmental products and services. Mm. And so when you, when you talk about like a, an office building that's focused on environmental products and services, then are you like getting a request for proposals for, for people to join? Or are, they, are you just putting that word out? Or are you trying to seed different companies there? Or how once, does that work? Once we announce this, uh, then we will actively pursue uh, any product or service that is uh, accepted by LEED or Living Building Challenge. Right, okay. So what we're finding now is p developers, designers, they're all coming here to see what we're doing and to understand it, mm -hmm. to understand geothermal. And so the people doing geothermal have offices here and they meet with them. Uh, our civil engineers have um, opened their environmental office here because they can bring people and walk them and see the stormwater and, and, and see how these various things work. Mm -hmm. uh, to, <clears throat> to start seeing solar and the integration, uh, the land use and transfer development rights. So we realize there, there's a real hunger, both for the knowledge, to talk to the people providing it, but then Serenby's small enough you can walk and understand how all these things 
connect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we know there's a need for it because people are coming in, and so we want to help facilitate uh, that. Over dinner, Marie joked, most people say NIMBY, not in my backyard. But we said YIMBY, yes in my backyard, literally. It's interesting to see how this has all evolved, where it came to be like, let's go see this farm. And then you fell in love with it. You got it. Um, your family wanted to say, hey, Dad, I don't want to keep on going uh, out to Atlanta. Let's just stay here. And then you put in a little B&B. &B, you get your friends here. Your friends don't want to leave. <laughs> and then you're like, OK, well, then maybe we should expand this. And then rethinking away the way how people live. And you see this great evolution of how these things are coming together. And now you have these neighborhoods. When you're structuring the neighborhoods, how many people did you say determined like can, can live in a neighborhood where, before it starts to feel a little unfamiliar? Well, I, I, I think that's the box. It's how you designed it and you don't put numbers on it. Yeah. So they're all very different. You'll see Selborne's very, Selborne and Grange are much less dense than Motto. But, but then on, on the commercial piece, Grange is very low commercial and is basically built out. There is one 12 unit um, condominium building that's going to look like an old feed store, keeping in the architecture and the old, the agrarian. And that will break ground this fall. And then basically Grange is totally done. That'll be the first community that's done. Motto, on the, uh, on the other hand, we have the uh, one Motto building, which is a 26,000 square foot building with a focus on uh, uh, health. Uh, and then we have now, uh, what, 10 and another six live work. So this is where everyone buys the building. And so with the intent, you'll see most of the street level uh, commercial are, are mostly related to health services. And so putting that intent, these are just individual coming in. Uh, that's where the, uh, the school uh, is. And then we will be breaking ground this fall with a apartment building with commercial, uh, with a focus on aging in place. And Piedmont, the largest health provider in the state, will be anchoring that uh, with a major building and re-looking at how we develop health care on a community scale. And the docs are planned to go into the homes rather than everyone having to come to the facility. So you can age in place anywhere you live at Serenby. Just because you have a health event, it doesn't mean you're going to have to live at, move out of your home. Yeah, and I think that when you look at what's happening in America, one of the largest reasons why people go bankrupt is when they have a health event and they can't afford it or they can't afford their health care or whatnot. Aging in place is, I think, really interesting, and it's something that actually Sandra and I had uh, witnessed in, in Singapore. I mean, Asia usually has a much higher appreciation culturally for their older folks. Absolutely. And, it's, and we saw some really incredible buildings, open air buildings that uh, many different families lived in, and, but it was largely for seniors and it was for them to age in place, but not to feel isolated, which I think a lot of folks felt isolated, especially during the, the pandemic. Well, the way we're building our communities and the way we're building our systems, uh, how we set up uh, availability to benefits, the entire system is set up to segregate our bookends uh, of society. And if you look at the richness of any society, it's, it's when the elders are interacting with the young people. It, 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 it's incredible for both. Mm. Uh, in fact, several years ago, uh, someone who had retired and moved here from uh, Landon and had never expected a bunch of kids, you know, because yeah. it, it just, that was the early perception. Oh, because schools were not good, this is going to be, a, you know, retired. And he said, Steve, if you had told me that I'd had these kids running by my front porch, waving at me and interacting, I'd have paid you 20% more. For the <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's just, uh, that's just precious because I think what people, you know, retirement community, you think about a retirement community, you're all the same age, right? That's right. Yeah. And then this one, multi-generational. And I would imagine as well for people who want to raise families, this is a wonderful place to raise families. I'm sure... Lots of young mothers and fathers have wanted to, you know, would want something like this for their children. Oh, you, you hear the stories coming out from every household, uh, whether it's young families or, or older people. It, it, it changes their perception. It changes their life. And, and it's, 
It's the way we physically build places. And that's, that's the message we've got to get out, is this is all possible. This isn't some unattainable thing. That more people should look at the components that create this. And we just have to remember how we developed 100 years ago. Yeah. This isn't new. I mean, one of the things that is uh, obviously undeniable within America, and I'm not saying that you have an answer to this, is that it is so much harder for somebody in my generation or for Gen Z, the Zoomers, to actually afford land in a house now. Um, and that's not on account of like just one, you know, one person's fault. There's a lot of macroeconomics that, that go into it. How can this dream, you know, become reality for other, other folks, like in, 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 in that situation, especially when, you know, I hear on news, like how a lot of Gen Xers and Gen Zs uh, are feeling like saddled with like so much debt. And I look at like my father who was a truck driver and he was able to get land on a truck driving budget <laughs> and he was able to build his own house and everything along those lines. It seems so far away for so, so many folks. Well, that I think is because of how we value what we think we need and we don't build places in a whole community. Now, people look at Serenby and it is expensive, but this was intentional mm -hmm. in what, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But this 40,000 acres uh, was what you would consider very affordable housing, farms, this uh, Palmetto, which is four miles from us, 96% of the kids run free or assisted lunch. Uh, this area, the taxes could not support the services. So basically, if, if you were to call an ambulance, it might be two hours. Uh, there was really no police presence because it just, in the bigger metropolitan area, the Fulton County, this area just didn't have the taxes. Mm. What we don't, we talk a lot about uh, when there's displacement, but we don't talk about when we lose executive housing. And if you look at a problem throughout rural America today, we've stripped them m many times of the agrarian economy and the, and, and the economics that really make an area work. And so we, we, we remove, as, as the tax base goes down, we remove services. So what this area needed was executive housing. And the people that would <laughs> help bring some of those things about. So our goal, for several reasons, uh, bankers didn't uh, support small lots. Communities don't want small lots because they think what it does. So it was, how can we really show the value of open land? Mm. How can we show that just because you have an eighth of an acre to build on, that it's gonna be poor people building on it? Mm. So, we had to change a bunch of attitudes and realize that the only way we were going to get attention is if we brought a premium because the people that are going to drive everything are the banking, the financial mm -hmm. institutions, and they look at the, that profit difference. So that's we set out intentionally. Right. We're just getting to the point where we're accomplishing that, at least with housing. And we're going to be doing some things to address exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it can happen. It's simpler buildings. It isn't um, uh, designer street lights, but there's no reason that, that we have to do that. But you know, does every building have to have air conditioning if you build it correctly and have geothermal? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we have a tendency to build cheaper products with high energy bills, and we call it affordable housing. Yeah, no. which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. And, and so stay tuned. We, you know, I don't, I'm not saying I have the playbook, yeah. but we are, are, are getting ready to address that in the next five or six years. Yeah, because it's something, uh, you kind of, part of what I'm hearing you say, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is like, it's, it's, really, <coughs> it's really challenging to address a situation as big as this first with affordable housing. It almost has to come with the executive housing first right. in order to be able to attract the value and people for, for people without imaginations to be able to see the value. That's right. And then with that value that you're building, you can then start to address other issues. That's right. 
And, and, I, and I think that is so important because, you know, we're actually doing renovation and building now and, and the, the cost of it is, is extraordinary, especially even during the pandemic with supply chain and everything like that. The cost is extraordinary. And even just as an individual, you just kind of have to say, okay, well, how would one do this if that's right. Income was a little less, you know, and or, or you know, yeah. without. And the other thing, we, you know, you start addressing these issues, they're really global, mm. and and global in, in in several things. So it's it's what portion of our GVT do we attribute to housing, to our food, and unfortunately, in 1950 we spent about 3% on healthcare. Right, it was reverse to food, right? <laughs> to now, what it is now. Now we're, we're headed in, I think it's 17, 18%. Yeah, and then less on food, and we spend less on food and more on healthcare. Less on food yeah. and less thought on our housing. Right. So I think our- we're, We've our, become our, reactive, not proactive. <laughs> precisely, Yeah. and that's my point. You, you, yeah. you can't take just the housing, you can't take one thing, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and say that's it. Mm -hmm. it. We've got to look at, at all these issues to make sure that we're able to afford the lifestyle that's going to make us healthy and happy. Yeah. And we've just stepped away our measurement system, what we're doing. Uh, a fear-based system creates a lot of these problems and that's where we are. You know, you've had to actually step away from this like individualistic approach of saying, I just want to get my family out of the city and I want to have my own plot of land. And arguably you're moving more into like a collectivist, I don't know if you want to call it that, mentality in order to be able to have and, you know, conserve and, and live on a larger slice of heaven. Well, I think of it as a biophilic approach to life. Uh, by the way, while we're standing here, did you notice the art that just happens yeah. to be in the meadow? I mean, yeah. th th that is a uh, eight-foot bronze of a man and a woman dancing in the, field, in the field, but they come together in a third lake. And so this is this whole idea, too, of balancing masculine and feminine from the Jung's perspective mm. in decisions and how we build places. And you'll see Serenby is a balance of that. And so uh, this was Marty Dodd saw that, he said, what you're doing is this balanced life. And Jungian philosophy was, is really rooted in nature. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So talking about you know, a, a biophilic approach uh, is concern about all living systems. So this is not the individual, this is about the collective, whether it's the collective human, the plant life, the animal life, these trees all, you know, we, we know they are communicating in a whole underground system. And, and understanding. And if we start just thinking about this global attitude that if you're better, my life's gonna be better. Yeah. If these trees are healthy, we're gonna have a healthier life. Mm -hmm. And so it's an entire biological approach to just how we live and how we make decisions. And you obviously you know, mentioned biophilic uh, design and, and thinking, and is that, how you came upon founding the Biophilic Institute, which actually we just happened to be here when the summit is happening. <laughs> That's great. How, so how, really, <laughs> we did not plan that. It just happened to be that way. But you see, there are no accidents. Clearly, no. You're, 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 you're going to learn or communicate something out yeah. that, that, uh, about that. Well, this, this really began um, um, in 2000 when the... Uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute was here. Bill Browning led that group, and he talked about biophilic design and biophilic approaches. Now, that was just a word that I wasn't sure I could spell, yeah. <laughs> and so I didn't think much about it. <clears throat> and then, uh, following the recession of 2008, uh, there was a lot of studies coming out that the, the, the communities the real estate that came out of the recession first were environmental or walkable. Mm. So <clears throat> from the time we broke ground, people were, were considering me just kind of this weirdo doing some strange stuff. Right. But suddenly at that point, people started coming to understand what we were doing. And they were putting us in boxes of new urbanism. 
because we were dense. But new urbanists aren't environmental. They don't have farms, you know, so that didn't describe us. Yeah. Uh, then the story on the agri-hoods would come out. So people would come saying, oh, you're, <clears throat> you know, agri-hood. Well, we do have a farm, but there's yeah. a lot more to it. And then uh, the Urban Land Institute also published a, a hard book on the 10 top environmental communities uh, in the United States. We were the only one with density. So an environmental didn't describe us. So it's like, okay, people are putting us in boxes. So how do we define ourselves? We had never had to communicate it until then because we were just doing this, this thing out here. Yeah. And so as I looked, I said, oh, we're biophilic approach to community development. Yeah. That, that describes what we're doing. Mm. And, and so that's really how we came to that. And we were talking about universities were starting to come and we were talking about creating a place. And then uh, we have a scholar in resident program too. And uh, uh, Puck uh, Mickleby uh, was here. Uh, and he uh, came out of the Pentagon as an officer at Marine and was writing his book, um, uh, The Grand Strategy. And he, um, Admiral Mullins had called uh, him and a, another person in to look at the threats of the United States. And after a two year study, they came out and said, uh, the threat is not external, it's internal. And if we don't develop a sense of personal responsibility and community, we're going to rot from the interior, and this is about 15 years ago. And and you know, and that that actually goes back to my conversation, you know, just earlier about a personal sense of responsibility. <laughs> it's so hard for folks to have a personal sense of responsibility if they're renters their entire life, and if they're moving from one place to the other, and you know, from and never have a sense of home or a sense of being or a sense of place, or grow up in a community where everybody's you know, trashing it. And they say, oh, well, they're trashing it, so I'm trashing it too. And, and that's, that's something that I struggle with because I do, I do see elements of that in the world where people are like, well, I don't want to own anything. I just want to tra uh, traverse everything. And when I'm, I'm now like kind of settling into a place where I want to live the rest of my life and there I want to serve, I feel like I want to serve my community more. And by, by giving your sense of, a sense of place, you give your sense of self a sense of responsibility too. Well, you know, I had I know, 40, 50 kids here from Iowa State yesterday. And one of the girls was on the same kind of approach. And when I commented to her, <clears throat> uh, it kind of woke the class up. She says, you know, I I'll never be able to afford my own house. And I said, well, with that attitude, you're probably right. Mm. And the students look. But I think what's happened is we've taken away a sense of hope. Mm. And so when you have a population that doesn't think they can, they won't. Right. And, and actually, one of the things that we decided to do as, um, as friends, uh, Sonder, myself, another person said, why don't we actually come together and get a plot of land? And you know, we could get something a little bit larger and, and allow ourselves to actually build homes and think about it. And, and again, like, like yourself, you know, is it, can it expand? Can it, you know, maybe, maybe not. And, it, and it's one of those things where sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative and think outside the box well, and come you, together. You, you know, you look, we somehow have set up an unattainable dream and thus, as a result, a loss of hope. If you look back through the decades, everyone didn't own their own house and they didn't own their own grand house. You look at the average size of a house in 1950, it was yeah. much different than what we consider needed and important today. That's right. And so I think it's just a huge readjustment. You look in Europe, everyone doesn't live in these big houses. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we have set an unattainable expectation and then that's followed by this loss of hope. And yeah. that I think is one of the big things plaguing us. And if, 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 you, um, if you see the kids here today, their connection to nature, their, their lack of fear is going to set them in a different place as they approach the world. Mm -hmm. And Acton Academy, 25% of the enrollment has to be on scholarship so that 
you know, if you're working, if you're living, it, you know, you, chances are your kids can go to that school and nobody knows the difference. Those kids that are maybe coming out of a household where the parents can only rent have a sense of hope mm -hmm. that they're going to buy their own house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. You, you've touched on something that's really plaguing uh, uh, America today. Yeah, I think there's also research out there about if the even if you come from a broken family, for instance, if you have a supportive community, then the kids turn out all right. That's right. And so at the end of the day, sometimes it doesn't matter how broken the household is or if your parents rent or not, but if the community you have around you is supportive, if you feel loved within the community, if you feel loved within your school, that type of thing actually allows for a healthier well-being in life. And how many times is that the elder that has the time to spend with the young? Mm -hmm. And yet we're building places that separate them. That's right, yeah. Well, I mean, you have given us so much food for thought uh, here, Steve, and I, I, I really appreciate the vision and I appreciate, you know, how, how the journey it's taken to, to actually get here. You know, because it it didn't come from this aha moment, you know, right in the beginning, right? You know, it, 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 it's, it was all these little aha moments over the course of, right. of many times. And you also relied on other folks to generate their ideas and to have like a design sprint and a design conversation with a number of folks who are the best at what they do they're the best at what they are at and you're able to like pick from all these different brains and like put together a whole new picture it's a community yeah <laughs> you know that's how it works thought leaders or or what have you i mean that that's through times it's uh, and, and and i often say uh when we have ideas of what we should do it, it's a path that many times has disappointments because we have preconceived ideas of what that means and what the results are. And when you take what I call a 90 degree turn on some place you never expected to go, every experience is full of richness because you don't have preconceived expectations of mm -hmm. what that is or what the results are. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to live more spontaneously <clears throat> which is following your heart many times rather than your logical mind. Exactly. <laughs> which is hard for some of those of us who are like more logical in approach. <laughs> right. Now, have you thought about the path we just came through? You noticed all the, the, the white flowers. Yeah, now, those, uh, those are all blackberries. So imagine blackberries the and also honeysuckles. Yes, <laughs> strolling yeah, here. You know, yeah. and, and then <laughs> grapes. I saw grapes and Virginia uh, creeper and yeah. tulip trees. I saw. So if you can have a complete oh, you know, snack meal by yeah. just walking and... And uh, we have some of the great naturalists here. They were talking about they've, there's more mushrooms than they've ever seen in one area in varieties that you can feast from. And, and so I think nature is responding to what we're doing, whether it's oh, the birds you sure. see, the, the, what we're seeing that you can eat that's coming up. And, and chemical free, mm -hmm. the nature is rejoicing and responding to us in a very uh, concrete way. I, I, ha I have to admit, your birds are so... Um, fearless here. You talk about people being, you know, without fear, but the animals are without fear too. Well, well, we, because we're all connected. Yeah. That that energy. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. It was. I mean, we got really close to a cardinal and a bluebird, and the geese are just all so affable. You know. <laughs> uh, the way really, life should be. It's the way life should be. It really is. I mean, this is such a wonderful experience. I love to see how it's like you know, changed just over in the last few years that I've been here and I'm really looking forward to actually walking to the communities and kind of seeing more of that as well. Good. Uh, well, thank you so much, Steve. This has been phenomenal and, and kudos to you. I mean, thank you so much for giving us like hope, you know, in many ways and in a different way and an approach to life because people need to see it with their own eyes and to realize that there are different possibilities out there than what, you know, may be currently put on our plates in the media, for instance. So thank you. Well, thank you for the interest and for sharing the story. Yeah, absolutely. 
Let us know what you think about Steve and his family's work on developing Serenby and navigating responsible development of the surrounding area in the comments below. And if you enjoy our films, consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notifications button, and even tipping. It really does help us out. 10% of our Google AdSense proceeds are reinvested back into community projects here in the Finger Lakes, and that's matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic. So your support truly makes a difference no matter where you watch. We'll see you in the next video.